Hey, it's Brock here from Rock Hill Farms, and today I want to talk about mythical creatures. These include Sasquatch, Chupacabra, and the profitable first-generation farmer. Now, rumor states that all three of these may have existed in my lifetime, but no one has actually seen any of them. So, I've spent the last four days with a laser focus pointed at trying to understand what it means to be a farmer, what it means to be a homesteader, and what it means to be some guy living on a piece of dirt, and try to define the difference between those, where I fall in, and what I can do to shift from one category to another. So I pointed that laser focus at the internet and watched every video I could find on what it means to be a first-generation farmer. And what I'm finding is there are different ways to skin that cat, but it's very, it's very hard to put your finger on. So I have taken notes from about six of the best examples I could find on first generation farmers. Some of these provide tremendous insight. Some taught me absolutely nothing, even though I listened to them for over an hour. I started my day by listening to Farm for Profit interview the Millennial Farmer. The first episode of Farm for Profit with the Millennial Farmer, I found it interesting, but I don't know that he really taught us anything. He was not a first generation farmer, he's a fifth generation farmer, he's just trying not to lose it all. The most interesting thing he said was that he makes more from YouTube than he does from his farm. And might surprise some people, but it didn't surprise me. So I'm going to go through some of these other examples, then after I go through all of them, I'm going to give you my thoughts, my interpretation of what I've learned over four years of trying to turn my property into a farm, and everything I learned from all the videos I could find. So, the second video, Clark Farms. He gave a couple of key definitions. First, the secret to becoming a million-dollar farmer is to start out as a billion-dollar farmer. Mm. Let's work backward. He said that, personally, he started with nothing, and he still has most of it. And I found that to be inspirational. So, he started off with 15 acres and farmed sweet potatoes on someone else's land. He says, don't buy land, just get a loan, rent the farm equipment you need, buy what you can afford. Now, the advice here was, start by baling square bales of hay. Don't start with cattle. Cattle is more of a complement to your profitable farm operation. He said there's four ways that you can become a farmer. You can be born into it, you can inherit it, you can borrow it, or you can, you can start rich. Or you can get an FSA loan, which is the only real piece of advice there. So the keys to his success were to work harder than everyone else. He had a regular job and he farmed after that job. He kept the money separate, regular job paid for the farm, Farm income paid for growth. Now, here's where it gets interesting. His budget called for $130,000 of equipment to start a farming operation. Now, this is, a, this is an ambitious plan that he's pulled off in real life. He started with $130,000 in equipment and rented 300 acres to farm. So, $130,000 of equipment for someone like me means I would roll in and I'd get a big subcompact and a bunch of attachments and roll out ready to till a garden. That's not what he did. He bought two tractors. One was 50 to 100 horse. The other was over 100 horse. He bought a planter, a combine, tillage equipment, it was all old iron. He bought a disker, a cultivator, a grain cart, a grain bin, a sprayer, all for under 100000 Then for 54000 he rented 
300 acres. So he had spent $200,000 before buying any seed. Then he had to get crop insurance, paid $50 an acre for seed, made $85 an acre for $26,000 of living expenses, says he lost $10,000 his first year. That's a lot of numbers. Now I'll tell you, when I watched his video, it was so well done, and it made so much more sense than anything I just said. But my takeaway from listening to him was that there was not a penny wasted in his equipment purchases. Now we're going to look at my buddy Stony Ridge. Stony Ridge. Stony Ridge Farm. He uh, talked about his mistakes as Stony bought 150 acres in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina to do regenerative farming. Now Stony is a guy who's doing it the right way. Hasn't been taking on minimal debt and is not using chemicals on his land. It's all cattle farming and he uses aggressive grazing to regenerate the soil. And I'm pretty impressed with what he has to say. But what he talked about was his five mistakes. Number one was underestimating the cost. Within the category of underestimating cost, he said that buying the land is not the expensive part. If you want a million dollar farm, buy $300,000 of land and you'll get to a million getting it ready to use. Because he had to cut timber, he had to grade the land, fertilize, fencing, water, 40 cows at $1,000 each, all the buildings, a farmhouse, a barn, and at least two big tractors because everyone needs a backup. Number two, as soon as you buy your property, you need to understand how the water flows on that property. Where is the erosion going to be? Where should your home be so that everything erodes away and nothing erodes towards your house or washes out under your house? Number three, don't put the cart behind the horse. He said he started with goats, and if you have goats and you get a cup of water and throw it at the goat fence, if the water goes through, your goats will also go through. So don't get chickens without a chicken house. Don't get goats without a good fence. Don't put the cart before the horse. Stony Ridge had a lot of interesting things to say. If you're interested in becoming a first-generation farmer, I would say spend some time watching videos from the Stony Ridge farmer. I would also say discard whatever I'm talking about because I'm running on zero sleep and <laughs> might be mixing my metaphors a little bit. Now we get interesting. There was a video from Upflip YouTube channel about Grace Harbor Farm. They had a goat farm that did $120,000 a month. And how would they do $120,000 a month on goat products? The answer is by specializing and by knowing the value of their products. So... What I would say, the analogy I would use here is, what is the ROI of goat milk? I don't know. Well, it depends on whose hands you put it in. What's the ROI of a basketball? For me, the ROI of a basketball is zero, because I'm not any good at basketball. What's the ROI of a basketball for LeBron James? A billion dollars. So it depends on the hands you put it in. So the Grace Harbor Farm started a goat farm and found so much demand for premium goat products from yogurt to candles to soap that they were doing $120,000 per month on a small piece of land. Next farm was first generation called the Shepherdess. No farm experience. She had experience selling fashion products and marketing on the internet, and she used that experience to flip into being a sheep farmer. And one more comment on the ROI is I don't think I could sell goat soap. It's not in my heart. I don't live it and breathe it, 
But in this building, I sold a million dollars of square plywood boxes because the ROI for the idea of why you would want those boxes, that ROI for me, million dollars a year. Shepherdess, first year, thousand hours, made zero dollars. Second year, worked a thousand hours, made ten thousand dollars. Third year, worked a thousand hours, made a hundred thousand dollars. How'd she do that? First, she failed at cattle. Then she went with sheep and she started marketing sheep to people who were really into it and sold merchandise and anything sheep related. She built an email newsletter and was the sheep lady. And what that means to me is that you can't win by dabbling. You say, I'm a little bit of this, a little bit of that, maybe this. You can't dabble. Dabblers do not win. Do something 100%, you might win. So, let's look at my piece of property. And I want to give you my thoughts on what I can do here and what I'm going to do here. And then I'm going to try to do it, and I want you to hold me accountable to the follow-through on this. So when I bought this 20-acre property, I said, what resources are here? And that's what I think everyone needs to start the conversation with. What resources do I have available to me? Okay, what is on the land? I've got a pond. Can that pond produce anything? I could pay people to fish here. I could feed livestock. Deer cross. Daily deer go down to that pond. I could charge people for hunting. I built an island on the pond. I built a windmill on the pond. I built a bridge to the pond. That becomes a scenic outlook. I could charge people to take photographs by the pond. What else does this property have? About seven acres of farmable ground. What could I farm there? Well, I don't know because I'm not a farmer. And it would probably take me the rest of my lifetime to learn what would be the most profitable thing to farm on my seven acres. But let's look at the rest of the property and then we'll come back to that, that farmable acreage. So I looked at it. I've got a pond. That's a resource. Then there's a hill behind the shop that is wooded. But the ground is so rocky, it's basically not usable for anything else. And the trees are in pretty rough shape. Half of them are dead, half of them are burned. It's a limited resource, but there are trees here. And trees have value as firewood and saw logs. And it's a commodity that I can put to use. But what I can't do is clear the uphill side of this and then farm there. It's not an option. Now, it does have this awesome building that I've turned into a revenue source multiple times where I've manufactured my own product and I've sold this product here and I've made use of these buildings and I've built an, my own building out there, which is now a sawmill shed. But all of this is not amounting to me being a farmer. So when I bought the property, I was looking at what can I grow here? I want to be a farmer, you know? I want to grow something. So I look at it and I say, if you want to be a farmer, first thing you need to do as soon as you get on the property, sell something. I'm selling things. I'm selling firewood. I'm selling lumber. And I'm making these videos and I'm bringing in over $100,000 a year in gross revenue from making these videos. Immediately sell something and grow something. So I've been selling I, the only thing I've grown is pumpkins. So when I bought the property, I said, what could I grow here? So, well, what do I have experience with? I had just been to a Christmas tree farm. I said, I could start a Christmas tree farm. So I named the channel Rock Hill Farm, made a logo with little Christmas trees on it. So what else do I have experience with? Well, when I was a kid, I had family members that had like 20 acre strawberry fields and you picked your own strawberries, and that was so successful that they had massive farms and were very successful in life farming nothing but strawberries. I said, okay, my plan's figured out. Christmas tree farm, strawberry farm, good to go. Well, we bought the property. Right after we bought, someone showed up and said, hey, we've, uh, 
we do hay in this area, and the previous owner did his own hay here, we'll pay you for the hay. And I thought, man, I don't have to do a darn thing. Someone's going to come here and cut hay, and I'll be a farmer, and I'll get the money. Well, I didn't get hardly any money. It was a couple hundred dollars a year. But there's more potential than that because there's more ground than that. So now I've got a tractor. I've got a hay baler. I can bale my own hay on this piece of ground, make a couple thousand dollars a year. So now as a farmer, I can look at it and say, what's the best use of my time? What makes me the best steward of my land? A thousand dollars a year bailing my own hay with the little tractor I've got? Or should I be farming something else? What if I grew a whole seven acres of corn? What if it was soybeans? I just watched Cole the Corn Star say they lost $300,000 growing corn this year. I don't have a combine. You could be a turf farm. You could be any kind of farm you wanted to be. And a lot of tough decisions out there. But I'm really thinking about the livestock aspect. I'm thinking chickens and goats. Goats will clean up the, the rock hill up here. And I'd really like to do cattle. So this is the part of the video where I want to hear from you. How does a guy like me become a profitable farmer instead of just playing tractors? It's not easy. But what, in my mind... If I start now and learn everything I can, my grandkids could farm this land. I'll never be a farmer on this piece of ground. Because it'll take me the rest of my life to learn how to do it. But I could be set up for a third generation to farm this ground and add a thousand acres to it. So tell me what you, what you think. Do, is there a potential here for me to farm on this piece of ground? I'd like to think there is. I appreciate you taking time to watch the video. Put links on the screen to a couple more of our videos. I'll see you next time.